good evening everyone and welcome to yet another uh, fine evening program on epilepsy and today uh, we have uh, one of the global experts on uh, treatment of uh, epilepsy in pregnancy uh, professor uh, dr torbjorn thompson from uh, karolinska institute in uh, sweden he is a senior consultant and he has made many major contributions in the field uh, so we are lucky to have him and he has been very kind to immediately accept our invitation uh, as co-hosts we have uh, professor sanjeev thomas the head of neurology at uh, sri chitra institute uh, uh, in trivandrum everybody knows him he has made major contributions through the indian registry uh, into the global uh, research in the field and we also have professor uh, sangeeta rawat the head of uh, department of neurology at km everybody knows her so over to professor thompson uh, everybody knows that it's a difficult time uh, to have um, uh, epilepsy during pregnancy there are special issues to women of childbearing age not only do we need good seizure control but we also have to look at the uh, side effects of anti epileptic drugs and teratogenicity and uh, who better can we have on panel today uh, than professor thompson please go thank ahead you. thank you very much for the kind words and thank you for having me um, being part of a fine program is uh, always indeed a great pleasure uh, Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, I'm, I'm sending this from my kitchen in my home in Stockholm. Uh, and just a word of warning, my home is under renovation. So if you, have, if you hear some unexpected sounds, don't worry. It's just the carp carpenters that are trying to fix my home. But the topic today is, uh, uh, as has been mentioned, the management of epilepsy in pregnancy. And what I would like to do is to go through stage by stage uh, what one might consider to optimize the management um, before conception, during pregnancy, and after delivery. Um, but before I do that, I just wanted to share with you some observations we did when we carried out a survey of uh, guidelines for the management of women, women with epilepsy um, within the uh, uh, International League Against Epilepsy. So uh, we were interested to see uh, what, what is already out there in the various countries uh, within the ILE uh, epilepsy community. So we sent out the survey uh, to, at that time, the 118 chapters um, in the League. And we had replies from 77, as you can see, and the countries responding uh, are marked in yellow on this world map. So fairly good representation, uh, including India. Um, the first question we asked was uh, um, if the chapter in the country has a guideline or recommendations for the management of women uh, with epilepsy during pregnancy. Um, 56 of the 77 chapters answered that they had guidelines. Then we were interested to see um, when these guidelines were uh, uh, last updated, which you can see on this graph. And as you can see, many of them uh, were quite, quite old. The red arrow here marks the year when the European Medicines Agency issued their uh, uh, recommendations for, for restrictions in the use of Valprit. Um, and um, it's clear that not so few of the guidelines that were still in function in the various chapters were uh, from the years before these uh, restrictions on the use of Valprit. Another question we asked uh, was um, if the guidelines included recommendations regarding folate supplementation to uh, the women. Uh, most of, of, the, of the chapter's guidelines did in fact recommend uh, folate. But what you can see from this slide is that um, there was um, a distribution when it comes to the doses that were recommended from 0.4 milligrams per day up to four or more milligrams per day, which was the most common recommendations. 
And then there were a few, less than 10% of the guidelines that did not include any recommendations regarding folate supplementation. So uh, just to summarize the results of the 10 questions we asked, um, first of all, the, uh, the, most of, of the chapters indeed uh, had some guidelines or recommendations. Uh, and I should, I should say perhaps that most of those that responded, because 77 of the 118 responded. Uh, the, the guidelines came from different sources. Some were uh, international, others were local. Um, as I indicated in, in the previous slide, um, not so few of them were of old date and uh, um, did not include uh, information that has been generated uh, during the last few years. Uh, although most did recommend folate supplementation, there was uh, a variation when it comes to the dose. And at least one fifth of the guidelines uh, did not include information on possible risk to cognitive development uh, and did not give information regarding specific risks with specific anti epileptic drugs, nor did they make any specific recommendations regarding which uh, anti epileptic drug to choose for women um, of uh, childbearing age. Uh, about one third did not make any recommendations regarding drug level monitoring, uh, and one fifth uh, did not uh, rec made recommendations on, on breastfeeding. So I think what we concluded from this survey was that um, uh, there is indeed a need for uh, up-to-date uh, uh, guidelines or recommendations for the management of women with epilepsy. I'm not going to pre present any, uh, any official such guidelines today, but um, the topic to discuss is the management of um, epilepsy in pregnancy. So um, we need, when we, when we discuss the management, to consider the risks. Uh, and there are risks that are uh, caused by the exposure to anti-epileptic drugs. Um, it includes uh, intrauterine growth restrictions. It includes uh, the risk for major congenital malformations. And it includes the risk for uh, an impairment of the cognitive and behavioral development of, of the exposed child. Um, but in addition to the risks um, caused by the anti-epileptic drugs, we need to consider also the risks uh, with uncontrolled seizures, both with, with regard to fetal risks uh, as, as well as with, with regards to maternal risks with uncontrolled seizures. And the challenge is then to balance these risks uh, and uh, to find um, a way to maintain uh, seizure control, in particular of uh, tonic-clonic uh, seizures, uh, but with, with a minimized exposure to uh, drugs that are potentially teratogenic. If we want to make a difference, a real difference, chances are best that we succeed in that if we act before pregnancy. Uh, this is the real opportunity. Um, the first thing we could do is to consider if the woman is um, in remission and if there's a high likelihood of uh, successful withdrawal of the drug. So we, we should reassess whether or not there is still an indication for anti-epileptic drug treatment in, in that individual woman. If there is, if we need to treat, uh, uh, I think all of us know that we should avoid valpert whenever that is possible. Uh, but I, as I will discuss in, in, in the uh, subsequent slides, we should maybe also be cautious in using to pyramate. Uh, regardless of which drug uh, we are using, we should try for the lowest effective dose. And if we have the possibility to do so, uh, we should document the effective anti-epileptic drug concentration before conception. I'm well aware of that these possibilities are limited and the access to such um, Drug concentration determinations varies uh, across countries and, and within countries. 
And the final point to consider is uh, folate supplementation. So I will discuss uh, in, in the coming slides the background for these uh, recommendations. And I will start with um, um, the risk of uh, intrauterine uh, growth restrictions uh, due to exposure to antiepileptic drugs. Um, this um, slide is based on data from the Norwegian uh, nationwide population-based pregnancy registry. Um, in, in yellow, you see the risk for microcephaly, and in purple, you see the risk for uh, small for gestational age. And what comes out as a, a signal here is a particularly high risk for both these adverse outcomes uh, with topiramate exposure. This is not the only study that has uh, found the growth restrictions uh, with, with uh, topiramate. There's another very similar population-based nationwide register study from Denmark uh, coming to roughly the same conclusions. And in addition, uh, you have similar observations from a, a different kind of study, the prospective North American Antiepileptic Drug and Pregnancy Registry. What you see here along the x-axis is the prevalence of small for gestational age. And you see that uh, uh, topiramate again um, comes out with the highest risk. There's also a risk with uh, uh, phenobarbital uh, and with sunisamide. But what three independent studies have shown is uh, uh, a risk in particular with the pyramate for uh, growth restrictions. So I think that is an important uh, observation which we need to keep in mind. If we move on instead to uh, major malformations, I don't know how it looks for you. Can I ask uh, the organizers? Uh, the right side of, of my slides is uh, uh, hidden by, by videos. Can I, can I, ah, I can do like this. Is this okay? Are you okay? Anyway, so. If, it is okay. We good. can see the entire slide. Good, fine. So I continue then. So. We move on now to what we call major congenital malformations. And this slide shows you data from three uh, major registers, Europe, which is the International Pregnancy Registry in which uh, Kerala uh, and uh, Australia uh, collaborates. We have the North American Antiepileptic Drug and Pregnancy Registry and the UK and Ireland Pregnancy Registry. So data from each of those four different monotherapy exposures. Uh, along the y-axis, you see the prevalence of major malformations with these monotherapy exposures within the different pregnancy registers. And for most of the drugs, you have uh, very similar observations. You have levetracetam, lamotrigine, and oxcarbazepine uh, with low malformation rates on the one hand. And at the other extreme, you have high malformation rates uh, with uh, Valprit in all of them. And then the other drugs come somewhere in between. If, uh, if we look at the Europe uh, Pregnancy Registry, um, the, the latest update was uh, two years ago, where we focused on the eight most frequently used antiepileptic drugs in monotherapy. And for four of them, we found uh, um, a dose dependency in the rate of malformations for Valprit, for phenobarbital, for cabamazepine and lamotrigine. Here along the x-axis, you have the malformation rates, and you can see that for each of these drugs, uh, with increasing uh, dose, uh, you increase uh, the rate of malformations. So you need to keep in mind not just which drug the woman is on, uh, but also what dose. Uh, just to give you examples, if we look at the malformation uh, prevalence 
with children exposed to Valpret at the lowest dose category, up to 650 milligrams per day. The rate was uh, very similar to uh, the one found uh, in the Europe study with a high dose of cabamaspine, over 700 milligrams per day. Whereas if you look at the low dose category of cabamazepine, the risk of malformations was very similar to that of a high dose of lamotrigine. So it's not just the, which drug, it's also which dose of that specific drug. So you need to compare each drug at a certain dose level with uh, alternatives at specific uh, dose levels. And if you go to the publication in Lancet Neurology in 2018, you will find more than 30 such specific uh, comparisons between different drugs at different doses at the time of conception when it comes to risk of malformations. And the next slide shows one way of doing uh, this, uh, making such comparisons between many different treatments. Here we've selected uh, lamotrigine at the low dose category, uh, up to 325 milligrams per day as the reference, and then calculated the odds ratios for malformations uh, with other different medications at different dose levels. And if you go from left to right, you can see that, uh, in fact, with a low dose of phenobarbital up to 80 milligrams per day, uh, or any dose of levotrastam and oxcabazepine, the risk was uh, uh, very similar to the one with the low dose of the motrogen. Whereas if you go to the right, you will see that uh, high doses of phenobarbital here in blue are associated associated with, with greater risks. And in, in purple, you have the uh, dose-related risks uh, with Valprit. So, um, as I said, the drug and the dose, that's what you need to, to look at to get an estimate of the actual risk for malformations. And when you compare different treatments, you can um, have that as a basis for your drug selection before pregnancy. Um, that was monotherapy. Uh, polytherapy, we tend to consider automatically is worse than monotherapy. I would say that this is not necessarily always the case. Again, we've used data from, from the Europe Pregnancy Registry. We looked at uh, uh, Valpret specifically here as monotherapy uh, in combination with lamotrigine or in combination with anything but lamotrigine. And we looked at the risk for malformations at different dose levels of valpret, as you can see. So if we look at the prevalence of malformations with valpret in dual therapy in combination with lamotrigine or any other anti-epileptic drug, the risk, in fact, is uh, lower if, if we look at, at the dual therapy at the low dose of valpret compared to monotherapy with valpret at a higher dose. So it seems that if you have to use valpret to maintain seizure control, it's probably better uh, if you can reduce the valpret dose by adding another uh, anti-epileptic drug and keep down the dose of valpret. So I was saying that um, um, it's, um, important to make decisions on, on drug selection before conception. Uh, Europe has been running for many, many years. And we recently looked at the evolution of drug selection uh, over a 14 year period from 2000 to 2013. Uh, and what you see on this graph is that over this time, the use of uh, lamotrigine and levotracetam has increased substantially at the expense of the use of, in yellow, cabamazepine and in, in light blue, valprit. So marked changes in, uh, in drug choices during pregnancy over this time period. And uh, I here superimpose the malformation rates over the time. And you can see that there is a decline in malformation rates uh, as we change the drug therapy. We divided um, this time uh, window into three separate periods. 
2000 to 2005, 2006 to 2009, and 2010 to 2013. And in blue, you can see uh, the malformation prevalence uh, in these three time periods um, for monotherapy exposures. In orange, you have polytherapy exposures. And you see a gradual decline, both for monotherapy and polytherapy exposures um, over time in the Europe uh, cohort. Um, statistics also confirm uh, a, a significant linear trend for a decrease in prevalence of major congenital malformations over time with monotherapy exposures. However, when this analysis was adjusted for changes in the use of anti-epileptic drugs or anti-seizure medications, there was no longer uh, any trend. And I, I think this shows that the decline we've seen over time in malformation rates is caused by the changes in uh, medication choices. So I think it's a, a good indication of that we can make a difference. And over the time, the rate of malformations declined by more than 25%, um, which is important. Um, there was also um, a change in the types of malformations. You see uh, eight different types or categories of malformations during the three time periods here. And the bars in yellow um, showed hypospadia. Uh, in brown, um, neural tube defects and in light blue, uh, polydactylis. And you see a decline over time in all these three types of malformations. Um, so uh, clearly the changes we've, we've seen over time uh, um, have been associated with a better outcome in terms of fewer malformations. The question is, uh, what about seizure control? Um, the left panel here shows um, uh, tonic-clonic seizures during pregnancy in blue uh, and in orange during delivery during the three time periods. And there was no trend whatsoever uh, for an increase in proportions of pregnancies with uh, major convulsive seizures uh, over time. The right panel shows uh, um, pregnancies with status epilepticus. The blue are convulsive, the orange are non-convulsive. Here the trend is in the opposite direction, but the numbers are so small, so I don't think one should draw any, any strong conclusions. The important message is that there was no trend whatsoever for an increase in the proportion of pregnancies with seizures, nor uh, proportion of pregnancies with status epilepticus, in parallel with these changes in, in medication that we saw over the 14-year period. So I think that's uh, uh, good and useful information. Uh, a very recent publication from the Australian Pregnancy Registry, uh, they looked specifically at uh, changes in medication before conception, um, in particular for, for Valproot. They had, uh, as you can see, more than 400 uh, pregnancies where Valproot medication was not changed before conception. They had 52 where the Valproot dose was reduced and they had a bit more than 100 where Valproot uh, was uh, uh, ceased. So no Valproot during pregnancy. It was taken away before conception. Uh, clearly, the prevalence of malformations was lower in the group that uh, had withdrawn the, their Valproate treatment um, before conception and also seemed to be lower among those that had a, a dose reduction. If you look at the number with, with seizures, um, there was um, slightly higher proportions of pregnancies with seizures among those that had Valproate doses reduced or uh, Valproat withdrawn during uh, uh, be before conception. So here it seems that specifically with Valproat, um, there was uh, a bit of a price to pay in terms of uh, uh, seizure control. Um, but 
the gain in malformation rates was um, very significant. Um, so turning now from structural malformations to cognitive outcomes, um, I'm sure you're familiar with this landmark study, the NEED study from the US. The upper panel um, shows uh, IQ at age six among infants that have been exposed in utero to either cabamaspin, lamotrigin, phenytoin, or valproate. Um, women were recruited in early pregnancy and the children were followed up until six years of age. And those that had been exposed to a high dose of valproate, more than a thousand milligrams per day, had a lower IQ than any other types of exposures um, in this study. If you go to the lower panel, this is partly the same cohort of anti-epileptic drug exposed, but there are a few more pregnancies, and there were also new uh, reference populations included. One, women with epilepsy that was untreated, and one, uh, children of, of uh, healthy mothers. Again, you see that a high dose uh, of valproate was associated with a lower IQ than the controls or the other treatments. And in this study, although it was 50% the same exposed children, uh, the high dose was defined as 800 milligrams per, per day or above that. However, unfortunately, there were no uh, uh, really safe doses of Valprit, even those that had been exposed to doses below 800 milligrams per day of Valprit had um, increased need for uh, educational interventions and uh, support. So uh, unfortunately, no completely safe dose levels of Valprit when it comes to cognitive outcomes. Um, that the NEED study and the subsequent study from, from Gus Baker included uh, a lot of lamotrigine exposures. Uh, when it comes to other newer generation anti-epileptic drugs, we have much less information on uh, the risk for, for impaired cognitive development. This is, I think, the largest prospective study. It's, it's using the UK pregnancy registry and follow-up selected children. Um, you can see Valproate with the same type of outcome as we've seen in the previous slide. Um, you have uh, children exposed to gabapentin, to pyramid and levotracetam. There were no bad signals here, but look at the numbers. Um, still too few uh, exposures, in particular with gabapentin and to pyramid, to draw any firm conclusions regarding the uh, safety um, of these drugs um, in relation to cognitive development of the children. Now, uh, these studies that I've um, shown so far on cognitive development assess the children around the age of six. One important question is, of course, um, what that predicts when it comes to future performance of the children. Uh, and here we have a Danish study, again, used on, based on national registries, uh, using uh, uh, population-based data. So what they've done is to look at good performance in terms of language, that is Danish, and mathematics later in school, and link that to uh, drug exposure data during uh, pregnancy. And as you can see, those exposed to to Valprit did worse also later in school um, compared to other exposures or other anti-epileptic drugs or no exposures. So it seems that what we see at the age of six is relevant for performers later in life. The same Danish group also uh, using national health registries and, and uh, drug exposure registries looked at the risk of uh, uh, autism, uh, spectrum disorder or autism in relation to exposure in fetal life to different anti-epileptic drugs. And they found that the risk of uh, autism spectrum disorder was increased threefold with valproat exposure. And for autism, fivefold increased risk with valproat exposure. Uh, and no similar risk seen with uh, 
other anti-epileptic drugs included in this analysis. So one point I mentioned um, regarding what, what you should consider before pregnancy uh, uh, was folate supplementation, which I think is a difficult one. And I think that is reflected also in the responses that I showed you earlier from the chapters with the distribution of, of different um, recommended doses for folate supplementation. And I think that reflects the level of knowledge we have. Um, what, what do we know? Well, we know that uh, uh, 0.4 milligrams per day um, is recommended to any wo woman that is uh, planning pregnancy or is pregnant. And of course, women with epilepsy sh should not be um, uh, an exception. Um, many recommendations and guidelines, as you saw in the previous slide, uh, propose higher doses, four to five milligrams per day. Um, but I, I think it's fair to say that we do not know what the optimal dose is. If you go to the prospective pregnancy registries that admittedly were not designed to assess the effect of folate, um, they do not uh, indicate that uh, the outcome in terms of malformations is better among children of mothers who took folate uh, periconceptionally than those that did not. This may uh, be uh, uh, due to confounding by indication, but we don't have strong evidence there. Um, we do not have any uh, consistent evidence that uh, um, folate supplementation uh, reduces the adverse effects of Valprit on cognitive development, and I will, I will show you that in a bit. Uh, when it comes to other uh, anti-epileptic drugs, the data are conflicting. Um, let me just share with you uh, a very recent publication uh, as a follow-up of the NEED study that I mentioned before. What you see on this left panel is uh, verbal index scores, sort of a verbal IQ uh, uh, with exposure. And this is at age six, with exposure in utero to uh, different anti-epileptic drugs. The solid uh, lines represent uh, the results in children whose mothers took folate um, periconceptionally, defined as starting uh, one month before conception at the latest. The dashed lines are the results of children whose mothers did not take folate. And if you look at the bottom, you see there's a, a significant, significantly better performance uh, among children of mothers who took folate, uh, if you combine all medications. But if you look at Valprit, unfortunately, you don't see this, uh, this uh, uh, beneficial effect. The right panel shows nonverbal index scores, and the pattern is the same. You see uh, a difference, a slight difference, uh, in favor of uh, folate use. Uh, if you combine all medications, uh, but no such difference for those exposed to Valprit. The question is also about doses. Uh, and the uh, table you see here shows the distribution of doses uh, in the NEED study. You see that among those that took folate, the majority, most of them uh, were on four milligrams or more. Um, but there was a wide distribution. And in the statistical analysis, uh, the result, and, and I quote, was an effect for folate on full-scale IQ at age six was seen with doses above uh, 0.04 milligrams per day. That is above all, all of, of the dose, or, or, or that includes all of the doses that are listed here. So in fact, the statistical analysis could not uh, identify any difference in the outcome uh, between the doses that actually were taken by most of the women. So the bottom line is, unfortunately, we don't know what is the optimal dose of folate supplementation uh, for um, 
prevention or reduction of adverse effects of anti-epileptic drugs on, on cognitive development of the offspring. So, so far we discussed the risks, uh, the teratogenic risks uh, in the broad sense uh, of anti-epileptic drugs. Uh, these need to be balanced against efficacy, as we discussed. What are the risks with, uh, uh, with uh, uncontrolled seizures for the fetus? Um, we don't have very good systematic knowledge about that, but we do know that the major convulsive seizures can induce uh, hypoxia and acidosis in the child. We know that when they occur during delivery, you see a marked decline in fetal heart rate. We know that in status epilepticus, there is a risk for fetal loss. And we have uh, one study, or maybe two, that suggests that uh, frequent major convulsive seizures uh, of the mother during pregnancy could be associated with a lower verbal IQ in the offspring. Um, I think this must be, must be interpreted cautiously because it's more or less one retrospective study that shows this, whereas the prospective need study uh, and similar studies have not confirmed this. So we actually don't know. But um, we need to consider also the usual maternal risks with uncontrolled seizures. I, I would like to stress in particular um, that um, maternal mortality uh, is increased among women with epilepsy. Um, and it seems to be increased tenfold compared to among women that are not pregnant, uh, that, that do not have epilepsy, sorry. Um, in the UK audit um, of um, maternal mortality, um, the majority of deaths during pregnancy in women with epilepsy were, were pseudo deaths. And in many of those, it seemed that the women had stopped taking their medication because of fear of, uh, of teratogenic effects of the anti-epileptic drugs. So I, I think it's fair to say that uh, for maternal and fetal safety, um, uh, it's reasonable to, uh, and even important, to uh, maintain seizure control, in particular of the major convulsive seizures, also during pregnancy even if it, it means that we have to use anti-epileptic drugs with some therapeutic risks. So that was a background for decisions we can make um, and take before conception. What about during pregnancy? Uh, well, because of the risks that, uh, that we discussed with seizures, we should avoid seizure precipitants. Uh, we should monitor treatment to maintain seizure control using the tools we have. Um, I think there are good reasons to be conservative when it comes to switches or withdrawals of anti-epileptic drugs. Uh, where it's possible and acceptable, we should uh, offer prenatal diagnostics. I'm not going to go into that. And we should prepare the woman for delivery. So I would discuss this a bit more. Um, and I would discuss uh, the well-known impact of pregnancy on drug levels, uh, or levels of anti-epileptic drugs, and uh, the meaning of that. I made a very uh, simplistic table here, where I divided uh, anti-epileptic drugs uh, into different categories, depending on, on average changes in uh, uh, drug concentrations during pregnancy. Um, uh, on the left side, you have anti-epileptic drugs where we see 50% or more decline in serum concentrations during pregnancy. Uh, Lomotridine in particular, vetracetam, oxcarbazepine, and, and uh, sunisamide. We have a group with modest changes. We have a group with minor changes. And then we have a growing group for which we have in, in, uh, insufficient data. We really don't know to what extent uh, the pregnancy affects the serum concentrations. An important question is, of course, uh, if these changes matter. 
To the left, you see um, a study conducted some years ago by Paige Pennell and her group looking at uh, lamotrigine pregnancies. And they found uh, that uh, if the lamotrigine concentration fell by 35% or more uh, during pregnancy compared to the optimal pre-pregnancy level, there was a significantly increased risk of deterioration in seizure control uh, during pregnancy. Um, and that has, in fact, been um, confirmed in, in subsequent follow-up studies that did include not just lamotrigine, but also other anti-epileptic drugs by Paige Pennell's group. Um, to the right, you see a meta-analysis um, looking at um, the possible effect of drug-level monitoring in lamotrigine pregnancies. The upper part of the plan panel shows uh, three case series where drug level monitoring, therapeutic drug monitoring, was used to, uh, to adjust the doses of uh, lamotrigine during pregnancy. The lower panel shows uh, case series where drug level monitoring was not available or not used to adjust the doses of lamotrigine during pregnancy. And you can see that the rate of deterioration in seizure control was higher uh, in, in the group where drug level monitoring was not used. So I think it's clear that if you have access to it, uh, uh, it it's useful and should be used. Another question is, uh, once pregnancy is established, um, is there any point in, uh, in making uh, changes of the medication? I'm not talking about adjusting the dose, I'm talking about switching or withdrawing treatment um, with the aim of uh, improving the outcome in the offspring. Just to remind uh, you of what you all know, that when it comes to malformations, the sensitive period is the first trimester and the first part of it. So at the time when the women inform us of the pregnancy, it's probably too late to make any meaningful changes in the medication. Uh, but it's reasonable to assume that exposure throughout pregnancy can have uh, uh, consequences for growth and for cognitive and behavioral development. So if we, if we look at the risks associated with uh, a drug withdrawal or a switch from one drug to another uh, during pregnancy, uh, you see to the left here data again from, from Europe, where we specifically looked at uh, a group um, that maintained their Valpret uh, medication stable, uh, which was the biggest group. We looked at the group that withdrew the treatment during pregnancy, and we looked at the group that switched from Valpret uh, to uh, any other medication during pregnancy. And you can see uh, in the graph that there was a significantly increased risk uh, of having major convulsive seizures in the groups that withdrew Valpret uh, or switched from Valpret to another drug during pregnancy. So there is a risk. Is there a gain? Here I'd like to share with you data from uh, Professor uh, Sanjeev Thomas's uh, group, uh, the CREP uh, registry. Uh, here they looked at uh, 93 of 1400 pregnancies where anti-epileptic drugs were reduced or with withdrawn during pregnancy. Uh, and, but the conclusion was they found no difference in the frequency of malformations, nor uh, in the developmental quotient among those that had switches or, or uh, reductions or withdrawal of medications during pregnancy. So while we know that there is a risk to do this during pregnancy in terms of loss of seizure control, we do not know if there is a gain in terms of better uh, outcome in, in the offspring. 
So I come to, to the last part, uh, and uh, that is about after pregnancy. And I think the most important thing to do after pregnancy is to encourage breastfeeding. I just show you a table from a very recent study uh, on drug concentrations in breastfed infants uh, on different antiepileptic, uh, whose mothers were on different antiepileptic drugs. And I'd like to draw your attention to the uh, two uh, right side columns where you see to the far right the serum concentrations in the breastfed infants and the slide next to it is the uh, uh, serum concentrations uh, in the mothers. Uh, I highlight lamotrigine uh, where we do have uh, indications of uh, that the breastfed infants may have in the order of 25% of, of the mother's serum concentrations. With much fewer exposures, uh, we also see with zonisamide uh, a significant proportion or, or significant concentrations of, uh, of drugs in the breastfed infants, uh, about uh, up to 50% of maternal serum concentrations concentrations, but please note that there were only four mother-child pairs included in this. But apart from that, um, in the other medications under study here, the uh, concentrations in the breastfed infants was really, really very low. Uh, phenobarbital is not included in this study, but we know with phenobarbital that you sometimes also can have significant concentrations in the breastfed infant although side effects are really rare. Uh, and this is the important message again from, from the NEED study where they looked at um, uh, IQ uh, in, at, at three and six years of age in children whose mothers uh, were on uh, valproteomotridine, cabamaspin or phenytoin uh, and compared the IQ in the, in the children um, that had been breastfed versus those that had not been breastfed. And there was no indication whatsoever of worse outcome in the children that had been breastfed, which I think is a very important message. So I come to my last slide just to, uh, to uh, uh, repeat um, what I said before. The most important action uh, an opportunity is before conception. And if we go to the last bullet, uh, I think it's important to recommend folate supplementation, although uh, we have to admit that we don't know what the optimal dose is, and we don't know actually what the optimal duration is. Most would agree that you should start at least one month before conception, uh, but the studies that are available actually look mainly at use up to uh, and including the first trimester. The question is um, if supplementation should continue throughout pregnancy, and we really don't know that. I, I discussed what we, what we should consider during pregnancy, and I think uh, I made a point that um, uh, we should be very conser conservative with switches and drug withdrawals once pregnancy is established because there are risks uh, while we do not know if there are gains. And breastfeeding could be recommended uh, in most cases. If you wanna uh, read more about this, uh, I can refer you to uh, um, a publication uh, from the uh, Epilepsy Task Force on Women and Pregnancy. Uh, it's open access in epileptic disorders. Uh, and I think that summarizes much of what I said and also expands uh, on a few matters that I didn't have time to cover. And I'll leave you with that and a picture from Stockholm uh, by night in summer. Um, and I thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Torbjorn, for a fantastic talk and a masterly expression of uh, you know, all the data there is on this subject. 
uh, made very simplistic and with very clear take home messages i'm sure there are going to be a lot of questions uh, so over to the hosts uh, to take questions professor thomas and Hello, Dr. Thompson. It was a very, very uh, good lecture, and I think it, uh, you said the guidelines very clearly. Uh, and uh, so there are plenty, many questions. But first thing I think in India, which we face, is unplanned pregnancy. You know, patient uh, they already come when they're already pregnant in second or third month of the uh, the thing. And I think there are many questions on that. If they are on valproid during this, do we? add lamotrigine to it and reduce the dose of valproid or do we uh, replace it with levetiracetam or we don't do anything and continue what it is? Hmm. Um, so the, the question was if the woman is already pregnant and on valproid, right. uh, I, I would be, uh, I, I would really not consider adding lamotrigine at that stage. If you, uh, if you add lamotrigine to someone on valproid, you know, we all know that the risk yes. of, of uh, adverse effects and serious uh, cutaneous reactions uh, to, to lamotrigine is very high, unless you do it so slowly that it's meaningless to do during pregnancy. So I, th I, I, don't, think, I don't think that works. Um, um, one alternative is, of course, levetracetam. But of course, we don't know if I'm adding a medication during pregnancy uh, that you don't know if the person is tolerating, the woman is tolerating, and we don't know if it's effective. And you do that hoping uh, that you would reduce the risk of, uh, of uh, teratogenic risks. We don't know that. What you do, uh, and, it, and, and it's very unlikely that you would have any chance of uh, reducing the risk of malformations because you're too late. And if you want to do a shift safely, this is not something you do within a, within a week or so. Uh, you would yeah. you would take longer, and therefore I think it's unrealistic. So I think the best it, 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 is that when the patient is already pregnant, you continue whatever. Uh, yeah, I mean what anti-epileptic there. What what I would do is, is to look back uh, into that woman's history to see if there's any indication that she's on a higher dose of output than needed. Uh, because sometimes you, you can figure that out by looking at the medical records from the past. And, and so maybe I could uh, consider reducing the dose of output uh, if, if I have indications of that that could work from the past. Any, any advantage of controlled release? There is one more question, whether there is an advantage of controlled release yeah. while yeah. through it uh, mm. during this. It's a very good question uh, uh, to which there is no good answer. Um, the, only, okay. the, only, the only data I'm aware of regarding this comes from mice experiments back in the early 90s. Um, indicating that it's the peak concentration rather than the overall exposure that's important. But that's only mice. Um, the, the only clinical study that has looked at this, um, to, to my knowledge, is from the UK Pregnancy Registry, where they looked at different formulations of, of output, and they found no difference. Um, so uh, there are no clinical data to support that the, the risk is reduced by by switching to uh, a slow or a controlled release, unfortunately. To my, to my surprise, the European Medicines Agency uh, recommend switch to, uh, to controlled release of output, uh, despite the fact that there is no clinical evidence whatsoever for that. Okay. Uh, Sanjeev, you want to ask? No, I think there may be other questions. To, uh... Um, yeah, there, there is one more on zonisamide. Uh, if someone has written in continuum, the zonisamide is pretty safe uh, along with levetiracetam and lamotrigine. But uh, SGA, small for gestational, uh, is quite high. So what's your comment on that zonisamide? 
Uh, I got the first part of your question, and I can take that, and then you can repeat the last part, please. Um, but when it comes to when it, when it comes to malformations, uh, data are building up, and there are a few hundreds of of Sunnisamite uh, pregnancies reported, in particular from from the North American Pregnancy Registry. And if if you look at that, uh, the prevalence of malformations looks looks low and good. Um, but I'm not aware of any good, uh, sizable data on cognitive outcomes. Uh, we had we, we had the small for gestational age, where it's similar to what you see with the pyramid. Uh, so that's that's a negative that we know. With malformations, it seems good, although we need more. With cognitive outcomes, we don't know. And the second part of your question was. Yeah, that was the second part. If SGA is pretty high, then should we hmm. use the zonisamide or no? If small for gestational age is high with zonisamide, yeah. then it's yeah. not recommended. Well, I mean, me. I mean, um, of course, it depends. If zonisamide works as well as um, as uh, Valprit in an individual patient, assume you have a patient uh, who with an IG um, and you don't want to use Valprit and the uh, levotracetam doesn't work, uh, uh, lamotrigine is not a, uh, might not be a good option. So nisamide um, may be worth uh, trying be because if the alternative is Valprit, I would say that it's, uh, uh, it's a better option than Valprit. Right. Okay. Uh, is the vitamin K should be given to all the newborns irrespective of the AD usage? Yeah, I mean the the uh, uh, injection after birth. Yes. Right, and uh, we don't have a 0 0.4 milligram valpro. I mean folate acid available, so most of the time we end up giving five milligram folate. Uh, is a five milligram supposed to be teratogenic? Teratogenic, five milligram fold. Yeah. No, I, yeah. no, I don't. I don't think it's it's uh, supposed to be uh, uh, teratogenic. Um, wh why? Why? Why should one not always prescribe a high dose of folate? Well, first of all, we don't know if it's better than a low dose. Uh, are there any any risks? We don't know. There are speculations about the risks. Um, and nothing, I think, related to increased risk of malformations. But there, there, there is very limited, but some experimental data uh, suggesting that it might have negative effects on, on uh, cognition. Um, but then there, there is uh, another concern, which has to do with, uh, uh, with uh, a risk of uh, uh, increased risk of cancer. Uh, and this is, this is uh, uh, a debated uh, topic, uh, and I'm not talking about the child. I'm talking about if you use it long term uh, to mm -hmm. to the mother. Um, there have been some discussion on uh, possible risk mm -hmm. of uh, of cancer. Um, it's it's controversial. It's not confirmed, um, but I think what we we you know we need to have good data on. Um, on different doses of folate. And I can say that we are currently using uh, our uh, Nordic uh, national databases to look at this, where we, where we have uh, drug prescription uh, databases uh, and the pregnancy outcome databases. So I guess within a year or two, we will have more information on, on uh, uh, risks and benefits of the high doses of folate. Which I don't think we have now. I don't think, I don't think the concerns are based on very strong data. I'm not saying that uh, that we should uh, um, abandon uh, four or five milligrams dose. I'm just saying we don't have evidence that it's it's better than 0.4 milligram. Yeah, the problem is we don't get the 0.4 milligram easily. No. We get the formulation which already has a four to five milligram. That is yeah, and then I then I would probably say that you know based on based on the need uh, study data and some Norwegian data, it's better to prescribe the folate you can prescribe than not to prescribe any folate at all. 
Okay. And uh, what do you think of lacrosomite in pregnancy? Uh, I think that I know. I, I know practically nothing. Okay. So <laughs> any comments from uh, Professor Sanjeev Thomas or questions from him? Uh, we use folate uh, 5 milligram as a routine basis. Uh, we have a couple of additional reasons. There is also a possibility that uh, folate deficiency may be existing in many women. And uh, this may be one of the... Right. In India, I think. Yeah. So in order to compensate for that also, we, as a universal thing, irrespective of whatever antiepileptic drug they are taking, 5 milligram is uh, being prescribed. There is a lot of in uh, uh, curiosity about how the newer antiepileptic like Vigoracetam uh, or uh, Rampanil, uh, but we have to wait for some time to know mm. how this is uh, I think, going to affect. In the meantime, uh, I think uh, Professor Torbin Thompson has very clearly uh, elucidated what is uh, possible today based on current evidence reducing the op, a pre, a concentrating on preconception care. Yeah. And uh, one of the ways in which we can uh, do that is many women or girls come to us uh, in their uh, 20s and uh, they may be in Indian context, they may be finishing their graduation or something like that. And these are times when they get married and uh, tell them to inform you when, you, when they get married or they are considering a marriage. That's a good opportunity for us to intervene and uh, uh, streamline or uh, simplify the treatment. And uh, that is how we collect many of our uh, yeah. preconception cases. Can, can I add a, add a comment um, uh, when it comes to, to folate also? And you mentioned um, the uh, high rate of unplanned pregnancies. And I think that's a universal thing. Yeah. Uh, which means that, I mean, we, I think we all agree that folate supplementation is important and useful. We don't know the dose. Um, but if, if we are going to be uh, successful uh, and considering the number of unplanned pregnancies, when we, when we uh, recommend folate supplementation, we should probably do that, not just in, to women that are planning pregnancy, but to women on anti-epileptic drugs that are of childbearing potential. And that, that would mean um, um, that they, they, they may be on folate supplementation for, for years and years and years before they uh, possibly become pregnant. Become pregnant. And, and I think that is, to me, um, a reason to... Uh, recommend the low dose rather than the highest dose because you are giving it to the wider population for a very long time. Uh, yeah. Do we have one, a question, one question. For, uh, one comment uh, or question? Uh, Nandan, do we have yeah, one question? Yeah, I have a quick question or a yes. comment and question combined yes. in the same day. Uh, malformation or uh, the adverse pregnancy outcome like uh, chromosomal abnormalities, nucleoidy are another major concern. And uh, we, uh, the current literature is uh, that anti, uh, I would like Torben's opinion on this also. Anti-epileptic drugs do not increase the risk of uh, uh, trisomies. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is the isolated malformations that are actually increased, not chromosomal abnormalities. Most of the prenatal screening is focused on to trisomies and other chromosomal Downs, genetic. Yeah. So there is a divergence in the prenatal screening versus the teratogenic uh, effect. How we need to keep this in mind. And elderly women, are another major problem because women or families may think of uh, hope getting a seizure free time to become pregnant and in or marriage itself might have been delayed. So they tend to become slightly older when they conceive and that is another risk. So these are two additional things. Uh, I think one last question can I ask Dr. Thompson? Nandan, is there a time? Yes, go ahead. 
yeah, the, I think there are multiple people have asked how often do you do the drug levels? Yeah, and no, in the saying. drug, yeah, drug, uh, you know, like a zonisamide, you, have, you showed a slide where more than 50% uh, pharmacokinetic clearance increases and we don't have a levels for them. So what do you do for those drugs also? So as an, as an addition to the same question, which are the drugs where you would do um, the drug levels? Yeah. Okay. And, at what okay. Time? and how frequently? Okay, I was I was start with 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 the uh, the question of which drugs, and I would say I would like I, I would since I have the, the the tool, I would do it for lamotrigine, uh, levetiracetam, oxcarbazepine, and uh, sunisamide. Uh, and and in that order of importance, I would say. Uh, and how often? Well, that also depends. Uh, the, the general assumption is that the woman is entering pregnancy on the lowest effective dose slash serum concentration. And if I have indications that in the past this woman uh, has had seizures on lower serum concentrations, uh, and she has major convulsive seizures because that is our major concern. Then I would like to do it monthly during pregnancy. Every month. I know, and I know the Americans like to do it even more frequently than, than that, but I don't see the logistics uh, working for that. I would do it monthly and then that, that will be the start. And then it depends on the extent of change that I see in that woman. If it's a dramatic change, I might do it more frequently. If it uh, seems stable over the first uh, one and a half trimesters or two trimesters, I might not do it as frequently. So there is an inter-individual variation. In yes, yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think even and in and then, region, there are... The, the, the question about what to do when you don't have, when you don't drug, have level. drug level monitoring. And uh, this is something that Professor Thomas and I have discussed and where we have specifically asked for your opinion uh, and your experience. So maybe yeah, you Sanjeev, can... Please go ahead. Uh, we have no access to drug level um, estimations, so we are going empirically. The seizure count or the seizure burden pre-pregnancy is the index that we use. In the during pregnancy for generalized epilepsy JME patients, we take uh, an increase in the myoclonus as a forerunner of adverse seizures. So if the woman is showing myoclonus, then we uh, go ahead and increase the dose. But if the that may not be always reliable, but for other types of epilepsies, again, it is not very possible. So we essentially go by the clinical response of the patient. So if I can add a comment to that, uh, I, I would, you know, they're not, they're not all JME patients. Uh, and even JME, pa and, and even some JME patients may, may, may have a major convulsive seizure without the preceding myoclonia. Yes, yes. Uh, if, if I had a patient on lamotrigine, which I think is the most difficult drug, and if I didn't have the drug level monitoring, uh, and if I knew that she had had major convulsive seizures before, I would, uh, I would say um, in mid-pregnancy or, or at least after the first trimester, I would increase the lamotrigine dose by, uh, well, say up to 50% or so, without seizures. Uh, uh, and anticipating you are a pro. Yeah, and um, that would be, for most of the women, an undercompensation. But still, I mean, to not not to uh, unnecessarily expose the few women that do not decline to that extent to too high doses. Uh, I think that's a reasonable compromise. So, fifty percent increase. Yeah. Uh, around twenty-five percent of women who are on lamotrigine may not show the uh, increased clearance. So that also. Yeah, I think that it's pharmacogenetic uh, variations, like where. 20% may show 44 uh, this thing, and then some so 77% decrease in the plasma clear, uh, you know. So that's. That's correct. Yeah. 
So I think we can end on that note and uh, would like to thank Professor Torbjorn Thompson for an excellent uh, talk and guidance on this subject. And both our hosts who are also experts uh, from the Indian side. And thank you very much to all the thank viewers. Thank you very much. Thank it's you very much. Pleasure. Again. Thank you. Once again, thank you. Torbjorn. Yeah, thank the... you, Thompson. Yeah. Thank you, Sanjeev. <laughs> Hi, hi. Yeah. Take care. Okay. Bye, bye bye. See you. Yeah. And here, same. there was the one question: Is there a lockdown in Sweden? Yes. <laughs> we don't. No, we don't have a lockdown. We, you know what we do? We we act, we we try to act responsibly, following the advice, but without. Okay. <laughs> I hope it works. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you.